Good. Good. There's a lot of people here. It's my first time ever speaking in front of people, so it's making me a little nervous. But um, should be good. I took a uh, college course called Public Speaking 101. So that means that I should have this all figured out just perfectly. Um, but one thing that the class did teach me is that you should know who your audience is, and um, you should know who they are, and that way you can hone their, your message in to them. So I'm just going to start off with a question, if that's all right. Um, and the question is this, who here is a Christian? Um, it's all right if you're not, don't feel like you have to raise your hand, I'm not going to judge you, but if you consider or call yourself a Christian, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, yes, more than that one. Um, have you ever thought about what that means? What that means to be a Christian? Well, according to the Barna Research Group, our age group thinks, um, and the Barna Research Group is the book that is the group that put out the um, book on Christian, and that was the promo video for that. And according to them, our age group of 18 to 30 year olds think this first and foremost when asked about Christians. And this is a quote from the book. Christians pretend to be something unreal, conveying a polished image that is not accurate. We're not known for the depth of our transparency, for digging in and solving the deep-seated problems, but for trying to project a Christian picture of having it all together. Young people talk these days about the need for authenticity, for keeping it real, not pretending to be something you are not, being open about your faults. Young people are searching for this type of person, this kind of lifestyle. And one survey we found that doing what you say you're going to do was among the characteristics young people most admire. And people don't see the authenticity in Christians today. Instead, they see us as hypocrites. And I think the problem is that too often we try to define who we are as Christians by what we don't do. I mean, your friend comes up to you and asks you what you're doing Friday night, and you're like, and asks you, you know, if you want to go to a party with them, and you're like, oh no, I don't do that, I'm, I'm a Christian. We constantly say things like that, like, I don't smoke, I don't watch rated R movies, I don't sleep around, I don't lie, I don't treat people badly, I don't listen to bad music. Why? Now, I'm not saying that, like, you have to smoke to be a Christian or anything, like, or that it's wrong to not smoke. Being a non-smoker is a good thing, it's healthy. Um, but why do we constantly blurt out the things that we don't do? Like, is that really the definition of Christianity? A life following a bunch of rules and regulations and making sure you don't do these certain things the Bible tells us not to? And it's bad enough that we constantly make ourselves known for the things that we don't do. But what's even worse is that we judge others when they do those things as well. We don't let people in our group unless they abide by the same rules we do. Otherwise, if someone goes, why are you hanging out with that person? You know he's no good. You know he parties all the time. I've heard that sentence said way too many times in church. Why do we do this? Why do we make Christianity known by the things we don't do? Why does the world define Christianity by a bunch of rules? Is it because we think God will be disappointed if we break the rules? Do we think God won't love us anymore if we do bad things? See, in this universe, I'm convinced that God makes the first move. And his first move is always to love you. Romans 8.39 says, No height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you want to murder somebody, and the only thing stopping you is you think God won't love you anymore, go start with the next Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, because here's the thing, God's not going to love you one bit less. Um, we always give Andrew a bunch of slack because for some reason he really likes Hitler. I don't know. Why. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah. <laughs> but I think God's a lot like Andrew Weiser in that aspect. Like I believe that. <laughs> I think that um, God still loves Hitler. Not saying that you know what Hitler, you know, did is good or that he supports it um, by any means, but I believe that God still loved him. Um, and so if the only thing that's holding you back is that you think, you know, God won't love you, well, that's just false and that's just wrong. God still loves you no matter what. See, there's a story in the Bible called the prodigal son. You know it, right? A father has two sons and the younger son asks for his inheritance now, which is funny since he's the younger son, he's not even entitled to an inheritance. But um, his father gives it to him anyway, and um, what does the son do? He squanders it, right? You know how it goes. Um. <laughs> Sorry, you <the> brother. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Tell him I said hi, dude. No, I found kind of no funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so there's a younger son, and he squanders his 
his wealth. He um, goes and wastes it on what we would today call sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, he gambles, has tons of prostitutes, um, but what ends up happening? Eventually he runs out of money and um, he finds himself working in a pigsty, wishing he could eat the slop that he's feeding the pigs. Then he realizes that even his father's servants back home have food on their plate. So he decides to go back to his father and um, you know he starts rehearsing these lines like, Father, something against you and against God and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. You just make me like one of your servants so I have food on my plate. But what happens? The father sees him coming. The father runs out there, and the son starts in on his lines, like, Father, something against you, and he gets out. And the father's just like, shut up, I don't care. And wraps his arms around him, puts a robe on him, puts a ring on his finger, kills the fattest cat, and throws this huge party for him. You see, the story shouldn't be called the story of the prodigal son. The story should be called the story of the insane father who loves his son way too much. <laughs> but that's what it's like to be God, right? Your son does everything wrong and comes back a mess, and you don't care. You just love him. When I was younger, my mom would always stick her head in my door and ask if I wanted to go to the grocery store with her. Usually I'd go, hoping that um, I could persuade her into buying me a Batman toy from the Walmart next door. <laughs> <laughs> but why do you think she did that? Do you think she like really needed my help to go grocery shopping? I mean, have you ever went grocery shopping with a five-year-old? I'd be like, Mommy, let's race! And I'd get a cart and I'd be like, you know, you know how you put like one foot on the cart and then you use it as like a skateboard? <laughs> I'd do that, and my mom would just be praying I'm not going to hit some old lady I'm to check out. And my mom tells this story, I think I was too young to really remember it, but um, whenever I was young enough to like, sit in the car, um, apparently after the cashier um, would check the stuff out, I would take it off the conveyor belt and put it in someone else's bag. And so my mom, my mom would like, come home and be like, I thought I bought cinnamon, and she'd look at the seat and be like, I did, but where is it at? And then she caught me eventually. But, uh, <laughs> but the point of the story is that, um, you know, my mom didn't take me grocery shopping because she needed my help. My mom took me because she wanted to spend time with me. She wanted me to see the things she was doing and to do those things with her, to join her in the things that she's doing. And God's the same way. Um, God wants to spend time with you, and the way you build that relationship is by doing the things that he's doing, which is loving the world and going grocery shopping. Um, the only difference is of being like, hey, you want to go to the grocery store? God's more like, hey, I want to go serve some homeless people food. You want to come? Um, it's a little different. <laughs> but you see, God didn't put those commandments there. And it's true. Those commandments are there. Whenever I make fun of the commandments and say, you can go murder whoever you want, people are always like, but it says don't do that stuff in the Bible. And it does, but God didn't put those commandments there because he needed to earn his approval. God didn't put those commandments there because you need to earn his love. God put those commandments there because he already loves you. You see, in that story of the prodigal son, there's another son, the older one. Now, when the younger son gets back and the party's going on, he gets jealous. He's like, but why don't I get the fatted calf? I've been with you this whole time. You see, the older son missed the point. The older son is upset because he thought the younger son got away with something, that the good life was out there in the land of prostitutes and gambling and that he was stuck here with his father working. Um, he felt he should be rewarded for all his work, and he didn't realize that he's being rewarded the whole time, just being in the presence of his father, going grocery shopping and doing the things he's doing. So you see, it's true. God will still love you if you want to go murder people or have tons of pure marital sex and break all the commandments, but why would you want to waste your life doing that stuff when you could be staying home with your father, serving homeless people food? You see, God realized that when you do those things, when you consistently break the commandments, you'll end up in a hell of a place on earth. Eventually the money will run out, the good times will end, and you'll sober up, and then you'll find yourself in a pigsty like the younger son, wishing you were somewhere else, feeling empty, broken, and alone. He put those commandments there because he loves you. He doesn't want to see you end up that way. Not so you can earn his approval. And on the flip side, God didn't put those commandments there so you can prove to the world how you're so holy and righteous and better than everyone else. Um, 
Because when you do that, you build up a wall between you and other people. And um, my friend Shane Claiborne, he um, said this one time, that we live in a world of walls. We put up fences around our suburban homes and bars on our windows. And we place razor wire around our businesses and churches, and we construct walls to keep immigrants from entering our country. And some of these walls are obvious, you know, concrete, barbed wire. Others are subtle, picket fences, office cubicles, academic bubbles, gated neighborhoods, other looks, cold shoulders. We even build walls with our language from four letter cuss words or academic jargon or liberal buzzwords and with what we wear, whether the dress code's business casual or hipster slick or punk rock. All these social markers create insiders and outsiders. Nearly two million people in the United States are behind bars. It's the largest gated community in human history. And millions more are held hostage to security, racism, prejudice, and, and imprisoned by fear. And the land that Jesus walked now houses the most advanced wall ever built. His, he wouldn't even be able to make his two-mile pilgrimage from Bethany to Jerusalem because of all the checkpoints. The Holy Land, Cradle Three Face, is one big gated neighborhood. And we build walls in our own lives too. When we break the commandments, we push others away from us. I mean, no one wants to be friends with a liar, a murderer, or a prostitute. I mean, that just doesn't happen. Um, but when we pretend that we're better than everyone else, or you know, that because we abide by these rules and regulations, that we're somehow more holy or righteous than everyone else, we build a wall and separate ourselves from them. Um, Jesus told a parable about a wealthy man who built a wall and locked the poor outside. Um, it's often a story known as the rich man and Lazarus, which if you want to turn to Luke 16, 19 through 31, you can follow along. But I'm just pretty much going to paraphrase it. Um, there's this dude who, you know, had everything. He was finding like the nicest business suit and ate at tons of five-star restaurants. And outside the gate of this mansion, there's this other dude named Lazarus who had sores all over him, which means he probably wasn't the coolest dude in school and um, probably didn't, you know, wasn't able to get a job because of that and was super hungry. And the rich man could have easily gave him his leftovers, um, but instead he left him outside, locked outside the gate to starve. And the story um, ends with both the rich man and the, bagger, and the beggar, Lazarus, dying. Lazarus saved, brought to heaven, and seated next to Abraham. And the rich man finds himself in a lonely, isolated hell, and ends up asking God to send Lazarus on an errand of mercy for him. It's a story loaded with a lot of irony and sass and imagination, but the interesting about it is that though the rich man is very religious and knows all about Abraham and the prophets and the rules and the regulations, his religion does very little for the folks like Lazarus, starving on the streets. You see, ultimately, the walls we build not only separate us from other people, but from God. In the story, Jesus exposes this truth about walls. They not only lock others out, but they lock us in. The poor are robbed out of community and compassion, but so are the rich. The wealthiest countries in the world suffer the highest rates of loneliness, depression, and suicide. Walls lock us in a self-centered world and deprive us from the thing that which we were made, to love and be loved. But walls are never too big to fall. If the story of Jericho teaches us anything, it's that walls can always come down. Our God is a God of liberation with a pretty good track record for setting people free. Some of us he's setting free from the ghettos, some of us from the shopping malls, some of us from our sin, and some of us from pretending we don't have any sin. The walls of Jericho fall without a weapon raised. Joy, trumpets, and dancing were enough to topple those walls. When the disciples marvel at the incredible stone walls of the temple, Jesus reminds them not to marvel too much because one day those stones will be scattered. And maybe this is the meaning of the tearing of the temple veil whenever Jesus died on the cross. God's setting free even himself. We no longer have to go through a priest, um, but he gave us his Holy Spirit to live amongst all of us, for all of us to be the temple and um, to be scattered across the world and to bring this world back to the garden. See, this was Jesus' beautiful promise to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of hell will not prevail. And yet even a basic study of gates reminds us that their very function is to defend they are no part of the offensive team, but rather are constructed around cities um, and countries and neighborhoods and homes as a defense shield, usually because they're obsessed with security and possessed by fear. Jesus' assertion that the gates of hell will not prevail is scandalous, 
suggesting that even hell and death have no power, but grace crashes through. And this is the promise we carry, that the gates will not prevail. There are all sorts of gates and walls locking us in, holding us hostage. But we have a deliverer and a liberator. We should be storming the gates hand in hand with them. Um, the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation 21, 25, tells us that in New Jerusalem, the great city of God, on no day will its gates ever be shut. The gates of the kingdom will be forever open. So instead of defining Christianity by the things we don't do and isolating ourselves from others, let's let love topple the walls we've built. Who have you isolated in your life? Who have you pushed away? Who have you treated like Lazarus? See, the word Christian, the definition of it is little Christ. And it was not a term that early followers of Jesus invented, but instead it was a title that others gave them because their lives resembled Jesus' so closely. Wouldn't that be beautiful if we did that today? Instead of telling people we're Christian, instead of jamming that message down people's throats and hitting them over the head to tracks and turn or burn messages, what if we just lived like Jesus did? Let's break down the walls our society's built. Let's love our enemies. Because when you do that, when you truly love someone who you have every reason to hate, people are going to start asking questions like, well, why are you doing this? And that's when you can tell them, I follow Jesus and he's about love and loving people. And then they might want to respond and join because they'll realize that that's the good life, following Jesus and spending time with him is the good life. But others, others will make fun of you persecute you and push themselves away from you. See, it's true when scripture says we're supposed to be in, but not of the world, but I'm convinced that we're not the ones supposed to be doing the isolating. We're the ones supposed to be doing the unifying because our God loves every single person on this world because God is love. And our God made you because he wanted something to show his love to. And our God made you so you can love him back. And our God made you so that you can love the rest of his creation and through that love show them who God really is, which is love. It's this huge circle, but it's all relational because God is a relational being. And he made us in his image as relational creatures, which is why like solitary confinement is considered one of the worst punishments. It messes with your psyche because you're made to interact with other people. That's why some Jewish rabbis even defined hell as Sheol or an abyss a place separate from God, walled off, alone. This is why the good life is not a life of sin, because sin ultimately separates you from other people, sin hurts your relationships, and left unchecked can totally wreck your life by destroying your relationships. The good life is living like Jesus did, breaking down the walls, loving everyone, and not pretending to be that you're better than someone else. Jesus ate dinner with everyone from tax collectors to zealots to religious elites and down and out women on the street. Everyone was welcome. And that's why when Jesus was asked, hey, what's like the most important rule of them all to live by? He responded, love God, love people. Because all the other rules and regulations and commandments are summed up in those two. Love God, love people. It's so simple, but yet it's so hard. Um, there's this song called Proud Man um, by this band Paper Mache, and one of the lines of their song, they define love like this. You can't love someone until you love yourself, but you can't love someone until you love them more than yourself. And that's so hard to do because that type of love is so backwards in today's society. We live in a world that's focused on self-gratification, on me, 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 so when someone calls us to love others more than yourself or to love your enemies, it's backwards. Yet, self-gratification is only pleasant when you have friends to share it with. Your new smartphone is only useful if you have people to talk to it on. And your new car is only <coughs> awesome if you have people to show it off to. Which is why I'm convinced that this backwards way of loving others thing Jesus did is the best way to live this life. Because when you love everyone, you may not have as many new things, but you'll have a lot more friends to share the few things you have with. So instead of isolating ourselves from others, whether that be through sin or pretending we don't have any sin or that we have it all figured out and are better than everyone else, let's just follow Jesus and love everyone. Love God, love people. When we truly do that, I promise you we will no longer be called hypocrites, 
Because people will no longer know us for what we pretend that we don't do, but instead they will know us for our love. So may you realize that the good life is not a life in sin, but is a life staying home with your father, doing the things he's doing. May you recognize and break down the walls you created and reach out to the Lazaruses in your life. And may you love the world as your father has loved you.